Greetings and welcome to Writers on Writing with your host, Dr. Brenda Green. Writers on Writing comes to you every Sunday and gives you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their lives, and their craft. This radio show is be paid for by Megger Evers College. And you may also watch it on YouTube by visiting the Center for Black Literature.org. I am Dr. Brenda Green. I am the executive director and founder of the Center for Black Literature, director of the National Black Writers Conference, and a professor of English here at Megger Evers College of the City University of New York. And I am very, very pleased to be in conversation today with UM Akpon. Akpon. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Brenda. Thank you. I'm happy okay. to be talking You're welcome. with you. Thank you so much for coming onto our show. I really enjoyed your book, but I'm gonna give our listening audience some, some biographical information about you. Yuwam Ekpon was born and raised in Southern Nigeria. He is the author of Say You're One of Them, a collection of five stories, each set in a different African country, published by Little Brown. It made the best of the year at People Magazine the Wall Street Journal and other places. The New York Times made it the editor's choice and Entertainment Weekly listed it as number 27 in their best book of the decade. It also won the Commonwealth Prize, Africa Regents, the Open Book Prize and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. And it won the um, Penn Open Book Award and was picked by the Oprah Winfrey Book Club in September of 2009. But we're here to talk about your second novel, which is um, the New York, My Village. And you wrote, I'm gonna read a quote from you that you wrote in response to New York, My Village. New York City has always mystified me since I spent first, the first two weeks in the Bronx in 1993. It was only when I lived in Manhattan in 2013 that I began to understand the metro system, to visit the different neighborhoods, to enjoy the ethnic dishes, and it didn't take long before I discovered the city's crazy underbelly. So I think that that really sums up the core of what you write about in, in New York, my village. Now, you... Um, present your perspective on many issues, which include colorism, the immigration issues, the African American, African experiences, um, tension between those groups, the colonialism, a critique, even religion. And you're a priest also. <laughs> I was a priest, I'm no longer a priest. <laughs> Okay, you're no longer a priest, but you yeah, start but even as a priest, I would still this is the kind of thing I would still do and had done in say you're one of them. Yeah. Okay. So you you have all these issues and you you've written a very satirical book. I was laughing aloud at times <laughs> when I was reading this, and then there was parts of it I didn't want to read because I said, Oh my god, look at what he's going through. And then the core of it is, you know, this publishing system. But let me um, ask you to be, <laughs> what was your process for writing this novel? Um, I, I, it, it was brutal. Um, it took me 13 years. Um, years. I wanted, yeah, 13 years. I wanted to bring the issues that are important to me into one book. I wanted to show what tribalism does, like in a place like Nigeria. And I wanted to see what happens to people like me who run from their refuge in America and you run into racism. Yes. So between those two pillars, and the fact that I am a minority of minorities. Yes, yes. And it was a learning experience for me. <laughs> I don't think about that. We don't think about that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's difficult because even some of us in Nigeria don't know how complex our country is. 
um, not to talk about a nearby African country. Um, so in the mid, you know, in this mix, I wanted to also say something about an industry that has become very close to my heart, publishing. You know, and I was like, these are smart people. All these editors and publishers and agents and they read like they can read a book in hours. So they read thousands and thousands of books and they're in the business of humanizing this world because we believe somehow that knowledge will lead to humanity, you know, humanness. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted, you know, to give them a mirror to see that they are not doing what they should be doing. I wanted a place for people of color at that table. And because of my experience of my first book, I had visited so many houses, publishing houses. I had the privilege because they are very, they are very hidden, you know, uh, insular. So each time I will walk into a place and, you know, it will just be like a white space. Everybody's white. Yes. And everybody's white. Everybody's white. And then I started to see that some of them I spoke to about this were also hurting and did not know what to do about it. It was very hierarchical and they fire and hire as they like. Yes. If you cry too loud, they blacklist you. You wouldn't get a job in that industry. So, you know, this, uh, you know, it's like um, where you should have democracy because of the knowledge available and what they do, humanizing the world. You don't have that democracy in there. Um, so because of this, I started being dispirited and I wanted our people you know, the Native Americans, the, the Asians, the Latinos, the black people um, to have a place at that table. It's a critical, it's an important table. So these were some of my thoughts. Of course, I've always looked at America and how religion in the Christian fold what is going on there. When I was a priest, I, I ministered to white people, to Latino people, to Asian people, to Native Americans, uh, to black people. Okay, so, so let's put a stop there. I just wanna go back to the publishing for a yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. Because um, I thought it was brilliant to use the publishing really to talk about, I mean, Sonia Sanchez always says, what does it mean to be human? to talk about the human experience and to show all the dimensions and to get all, you brought able to bring all those issues together. Mm -hmm. So if you had to talk to a group of publishers today, yeah. you're at a forum and you had to speak to a group of publishers, what message would you give them? Because sometimes, you know, as I said, you're kind of invisible. I think part of what we see is, I don't know if they realize how, how many times they, there's this invisibility. And then, of course, you bring up the perceptions of Africans, perceptions of Blacks. What message would you give publishers from small houses and, and larger houses? Um, I would say to them, put people of color on the boards. If the boards of these big houses said to them yesterday, diversify they would have done so. It's very hierarchical. The board, the leaders set the tone. Uh, Google has done it. So I don't understand why it did not happen sooner in publishing. And because of the Judge Floyd effect, um, a lot of them are scampering now. I hope that uh, a scrambling now, I hope that will continue to be the case. They're looking for black people to promote, uh, to give power to, because they've suddenly realized that they're naked 
and they've been, you know, so so I would I would deal with the board. So who are these people on the boards who have refused to see that this world is diverse? Um. Uh, Dr. Brenda, I, I can't tell you the number of rank and file editors and my friends who are white in the system who told me how frustrated. I mean, they saw what was going on. They saw, they saw it. They saw it. They wanted change. You cannot speak. They'll fire you. They, will, really fire, they will fire you. They, you see, you never see them advertise for you know, we need an editor. Uh, we need because they don't need to. It's by apprenticeship that people get to be editors, which means you go to somebody's birthday party and you run into an editor and you say, I would like to do this. I love to do this. And he says, Okay, here is my phone number. Call me during this time. Someone introduces you to that one. And then there is an internship available. You are called in. And you do that internship, and then later they bring you in. Okay, okay, so so what what would you say about the perception of Africans and Blacks with respect to the publishing industry? What kind of books are they? Do they want to publish? Since this came up in your novel, you know, wanting to hear the trauma of the, of, ah. of your experiences with the Biafran War, for example, or even though you had you were not even born there, so so. <laughs> What can you say, born by that time, what can you say about um, the perceptions of, of Blacks in publishing and Africans in publishing? It's, we got no chance because if you go in as the only one, okay, it's like bringing in one woman to walk among, you know, like among 50 men. What yes. are you gonna do? You know, you're going to have a thousand conversations in your head to see how you can play that politics. Right. Okay. So it's, it's still very limiting. Yeah. Still. It's, still it's very still, limiting. It's very, it's very limiting. Let me say this to you, Dr. Brenda. Um, the situation is such that before you know it, white, our white brethren are already more tense than we are. Like you're talking about racism too much. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Okay. And right. then, you know, George Floyd happens and we cry and cry. After one month, they say it's too much. Let's change the topic. We get it. We get it. We get it. We get it. So we, we come down. Then it keeps happening. It keeps happening. It keeps happening. You know, so um, it's the same thing I suspect in publishing. You know, the, you know, the powers that be get tired of too many race books. Right. We're going to, this is very incriminating. This is too anti-white. How, how can we control this? How can we shape this? Uh, it's too much. You see? I can't, right. Well, you, you have really captured that. So you call this New York my village. Yes. Uh, well, tell us about the metaphor of village <laughs> and, and how that differs and compares with the whole concept of village from the African perspective. Uh, yeah, you see, our at least from where I stand, we don't usually look at New York as a village. Yes. We look at it as a big sprawling city of a million tribes and races. Okay, that's how we look at New York. So there's something about it being impersonal. Like any big city in the world is very impersonal. You know, you, we are very close together, but we cannot really see each other, okay? So in that sense, it's very different from say the village I grew up in in Nigeria. Um, but so what now becomes our meeting places are the workplace, the church, your neighbors, you know a few people in the system, your family, okay? Um, if you go to a coffee shop many times, you also, you know, pally a bit with the people. So this is what I was trying, you know, to, you know, to do, to say no matter how 
impersonal this is. It's still very humane. These New Yorkers are not that different from the people of my village. Their needs are the same. To be accepted, to be loved, and they quarrel, and they backbite, and stuff happens good you know, or bad. So this is my... <clears throat> Well, you really draw the reader in in telling some of those stories. I mean, I could, I don't want to spoil our <laughs> readers, but there was one story that just had chills. <laughs> you know what that is. <laughs> I know which one. There are many ones. Like which one? I know. Well, the story, your apartment, and what you had to deal with the infestation. Oh, uh, bed box. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Every time I read that, I started. You know, I was don't read it. Don't read it. I said, I can't read this at night because I started having dreams. <laughs> But um, the way you capture that, and then the, the whole, it was also a critique and satire on, on colorism. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the, the skin lighteners, you yeah. know, um, yeah. the, re it, the religion. Yeah, it is. Um, Catholicism. Yes. The hypocrisy. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, it, I, bottom line is an invitation to everyone to do better than they did yesterday. So nobody is safe from my satire. That's right. <laughs> nobody, that's right. You, you know. You're just, you're, that's the mirror. You, you're giving <laughs> us a mirror to look at what's going on. And all, like you said, all races, all ethnic groups, um, yeah. you know, people from different areas, you know, and at the core is the publishing. Yeah. So, so, you know, when, you, when we looked at it, you, of course you named the person, your protagonist, who receives a, a special a fellowship, the Tony Morrison. Yes. <laughs> the Tony Morrison Fellowship. So uh -huh. that says to me that you're reading Tony Morrison. I always think about that writers are in conversations with other writers, that you you become part of this, this big group of writers who are talking to each other. And you also have people you admire. So who are you in conversation with? Who are the people who you admire, who are the people who are on your bedstand? Brenda, you're going to put me in trouble with my friends. I want to mention. <laughs> okay, well, you only have to mention what you. Well, that's that's a that's a premise. You can't mention all of them. So just give us one or two. <laughs> with that, well, or if you don't want, or you can just say, who are you in conversation with? Oh, okay. Um, let me do it this way. Um, I'm reading. Um, I am, um, what is it, proofreading um, something for one of my friends. Her name is Chinelo Oparanta. Um, <clears throat> he's writing, she's writing this book uh, and she's given this to me and I'm reading it now. Um, I love it, I love it a lot uh, and I'm reading it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm reading right now. And, you know, and, and try, You're I don't Supporting want... other writers. You support, you believe in really supporting other writers and reading their works. I, I do, but I don't always have the time. Um, and then I have to also pick those whose work I choose to read because there might be interference. I might be writing something and I wouldn't like to read that thing in another form. Yeah. Um, you know, so in that sense, it's very complex, you know, for me. But yes, I would, you know, I, I support many writers, especially the younger ones, uh, try to help them find their, you know, their, their feet. Even if, even if when I'm not reading their work, I'm hanging out with them, supporting them, um, letting them feel comfortable, you know, buying them books. Um, you know, like, look, this is what it is like. Uh, what you are feeling now is valid, hang in there. But remember, this is not the only gift you have. Um, do what you can 
take care of your mental health as you try to navigate this <clears throat> rough terrain. It looks like a very blue, beautiful sea when there are sharks in that water, you know? Um, and to, you know, yeah, so that's, you know, that's my belief. What do you, what do you say to them about craft? <clears throat> I, I say to them, look, uh, make your characters a very uh, compelling and make them very complex. If you have, you know, a good person in the book, a person you, con you consider to be a good person, make sure that person has a flaw. If you have a bad person in the book, make sure that person gets at least one thing right in life. It will make bring your character characters closer to the reader. Okay. So I know there are many ways to do this. Some people write without describing their, their characters, you know, <clears throat> but I do that a lot. And for me, it's a way to get my readers to see the character, to see the bodily form that is, you know, the outer covering of this psychology, the psychology of the, you know, the characters. That goes to your background in philosophy. You were partially a philosophy major, right? Yes, philosophy yes, yes. Humanities. Yes. yes. So, so that's a good segue as we, you know, before you know it, we're, we're believe it, we're almost at a close. But what is your philosophy um, or your writing, your, your writing process? I said your philosophy about writing. What is your writing process? You started to talk about, just tell us a little bit more. My... My this thing is this, get a likable character, um, give this person a dream. The dream has to be shared viscerally with the reader. And then launch this person on the way to this dream, send him, her, there on a mission and then put a stumbling block in front of them. The story will arise. And that's what your process has been. This is what my process, if I put it in a nutshell, you know, is so if you take Ekong, Ekong wants to come to New York City. Yes. <laughs> and then at the embassy, he's already a dead man in the embassy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, so that's, that's the summary. That's what I tell my students. Every, every day. Uh, people have written novels other ways and you know that's why they need to also listen to other teachers and writers, you know. But for me, this is how I, I think of doing it. So if you look at my short stories, it's the same thing. Uh, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, like Ekong, is thinking of this beautiful place in New York, New York. And then, you know, bed bugs show up. And yes. from point, it's not funny. No, it's and not. It's not. not it's funny. really, it's yeah. reality. We got some real reality bites, yeah. you know, from, from your perspective, you show yeah. the complexity, the complexity of the village. Yeah. Now, as we as we come to a close, you know, I host the National Black Writers Conference, and um, I wanted to get your thoughts on whether we still need to have places like conferences where we bring together writers from the African diaspora, or should we just like, you know, this is America, we should just have everyone. What are your thoughts on the need for having conferences just focused on writers from the African diaspora? We should, <coughs> excuse me, we should continue. We are not yet there at that point where, you know, we will say, let's, you know, you know, it, it's like saying affirmative action. You know, I can imagine there'll be a time when affirmative action would be killed off, but we are not yet there. So we have to, I, I would continue. Uh, I would continue to energize our people because Dr. Brenda, you an American, 
you know better than I do that there are dark forces at this moment among you know white people who we live in a society constructed by race which yeah. like you said we, and, we cannot and, escape that and if we people of color and our allies among the whites if we back down these people will crush us they are very intimidated okay but we are doing them a favor we have to educate we have to keep putting it in their faces as gentle as possible, as humanly as possible. Um, but we are lucky we have allies in the white world. Okay, we are lucky. Dr. Yeah, we have Luther to con co collaborate with this. Yeah, Dr. Luther King, Martin Luther King was able to recognize that and coin a language that helped these white people to feel, yes, we need you on this journey to being you know free um so 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 we need we need to keep this in mind um i cannot tell you how many white people helped me write this book i i can tell you in that publishing world many of them were like when what you are saying is true you've been rejected and rejected it doesn't take away the fact we will help you. What information do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Um, it gave me a lot of, you know, hope I go to Latinos. They, you know, they spoke to me, told me their version of the story, the Asian Americans, you know. <clears throat> um, one writer, Tony Groom, you know, he's in Atlanta. Um, he's written a book called Birmingham, Birmingham like bomb. Yes, I've read that. He's, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's been at our conference. Yes. yes, he brought together a group of African-American professionals in Atlanta and wanted me to read, say you're one of them to them. And we had this conversation and many of them were saying to me, when, when are you going to write like this about America? We need this voice to tackle our issues. When are you going to do this? When are you going? And it shocked me because these were very successful people. Right. You know, medical doctors, lawyers, professors. Right. And said, we need this voice in America. We need your imagery. So I'm very thankful to God and to my friends that I was able to get this together. I'm well, very thank you very much for writing this important yeah. novel, this this um, well written, critical. Um, engaging novel, New York, My Village. I want to encourage our audience to go out and purchase this book. I have been in conversation with Yuwan Akpan, uh, a Nigerian novelist. I really want to um, commend you and look forward to reading your work and look forward to meeting you at another time. And uh, you're welcome. And remember, the writer is always reading. The reader is always writing. Keep reading and writing. Empower yourselves as readers and writers. This has been Dr. Brenda Green. Write me at writers at mec.cuny.edu. And this broadcast is paid for by Megger Evers College. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Brenda. Okay. Okay.